Hey everyone, good morning. It is freezing today. I know I'm British and that means that we talk about the weather a lot, but it was 25 degrees last week, then it was snowing yesterday, and now it is zero degrees, but sunny. I woke up really early at half four because the birds were very loud, and I don't even mind because it was a lovely sound, but because I was wide awake, I did a couple of hours of work, which means I wanna take a couple of hours off work this morning and go for a walk, which I will take you on, because as I said, it's freezing, but really sunny. So we're gonna do that, but first we're gonna buy a book. That's what I would like to do. I mentioned in a previous video, I think maybe even the last video, that I had been thinking about books that I'd read last year and loved, one of which was Pew by Catherine Lacey, and I hadn't read any of her backlist books, so I said I'd bought two of those. This is The Answers, which is a novel about a woman with a chronic illness who's hired to be someone's girlfriend, but a very specific girlfriend. She is his emotional girlfriend. And then he also has a maternal girlfriend, an anger girlfriend, and an intimacy team. It sounds really bizarre. So I bought that and also her collection of short stories, Certain American States. Then I watched Grace's video, which I think she uploaded last week, where she was doing a similar thing, reading books by authors who she'd read one book by and loved to see if they would become new favourite authors. And I thought that was a great theme for a vlog. So I'm borrowing that theme, Grace. Thank you very much. I will link Grace's channel in the description box down below. Go and subscribe to her if you're not already. So I'm gonna go through my 2020 favourites video and remind myself of the books that I read and loved and which ones are authors who I haven't read anything else from. Let's do it. Okay, I've got my computer here. Let's run through the list of favourites. There was People From My Neighbourhood by Hiromi Kawakami, and that was my first read by Hiromi Kawakami, but I've since read more by them. Then there was How To Wash A Heart, which was my first read by Buna Kapil as well, and I know that I have another book of theirs on my shelf. Let me go and get it. This is a poetry collection, which is called Schizophrene. It's difficult to sum up poetry collections before you've read it. This one also doesn't have um, a blurb, it just has quotes, but it says, Schizophrene is an account of imagination, trauma, told through memory, research, vision, and hallucination. I love The Wanderer by Peter van der Ende, which is a graphic novel, but I'm pretty sure that's the only book that he has published. This Green and Pleasant Land by Aisha Malik, who I've read before. The Vanishing Half by Britt Bennett, who I hadn't read before, and I know that she's got a debut called The Mothers. Pet by Akweke Meze, who I had read before, I read Fresh Water. Tiny Moons by Nina Minga Powells, I have since read her collection Magnolia. Leave the World Behind by Ruman Alam, who I haven't read before. In the Dream House by Carmen Marie Machado, whose short story collection, Her Body and Other Parties, I've already read. A Kind of Spark by Al McNichol, I've since read her second book. The Tea Dragon Society by Kay O'Neill, I've read pretty much all of their books now, big fan. <laughs> How to Do Nothing by Jenny O'Dell. Let me look this up. I don't think that Jenny O'Dell has another book out, though she does have a new book coming out this summer which I'm very excited about. Yes, she doesn't, but she does have a book coming out on the 3rd of August called Inhabiting the Negative Space, a hopeful meditation on how periods of inactivity become reimagined as fertile spaces for design and how we might use this strange moment in history. Okay. Um, Pew by Catherine Lacey, as I said, I've picked up more books by her. Bernadine Evaristo, who I've read several books by. Sarah Moss, I have read all of her books, apart from one, I think. Hamnet by Maggie O'Farrell, again, I've read many of her books. Summer by Ali Smith, I've read every single one of her books. Sitting Pretty by Rebecca Tausig. I would love it if Rebecca had another book out, but she doesn't. Um, the Other Bennett Sister by Janice Hadlow was fantastic. The only other book by her that she's published, I think, is a non-fiction book um, about the Georgian period, I want to say, and it's not something that particularly appeals to me, though I loved her fiction. And The Bass Rock by Evie Wilde, and again, I have read all of her books. So, out of that list, there was Catherine Lacey and Barnu Kapil, so I have their books here, and then there was also Britt Bennett, and Ruman Alam. Let's look at Ruman's previous book. So he's published two books before Leave the World Behind, which was a very unsettling book, quite reminiscent of Never Let Me Go, but more 
on the side of horror not overt horror but like psychological horror Ugh. uh okay so he's written rich and pretty which is about is it two sisters yeah two child no two childhood best friends transitioning into their adult lives um and they've grown apart and then they meet again and then there's that kind of mother which has not great reviews actually so it's about a white mother who hires a black nanny then the nanny dies and she adopts their son yeah and then she's learning to navigate motherhood in a different way raising two children whom she loves with equal ferocity but whom the world is determined to treat differently now that does sound interesting but the reviews uh, are not good lots of one star reviews but I do find that his writing style does take some uh, getting used to and it's definitely not for everyone so I could see that it could divide people. And then there was Britt Bennett and there's The Mothers which I've heard amazing things about. But The Mothers is also one of those books that I almost feel like I've read because I've heard so many people talk about it. It's still on my radar but it's not really high up I don't think. So let's look at 2019 and see if there are any other authors on that list that I can look into. Okay, so in 2019, all of the authors that I've read, I'd read lots of things by, apart from one, and that was a Persephone book, which was Doreen by Barbara Noble. I read the other day that Persephone books are leaving London and moving to Bath, and that has broken my heart a little bit, though I do completely understand it. Um, and I loved that book so, so much, and it's the book that I always say to people who ask what Persephone book shall I start with, I say start with Doreen. I will link Persephone in the description box down below. I've never looked at what else Barbara Noble has written. I don't think that Persephone published anything else by her, but I've just Googled her, and she did publish a few other books, one of them is called The House Opposite. Now, I am not a huge fan of World War II novels. I think I've just read a few too many of them. However, Doreen is set during the Second World War. It is an evacuation novel. The House Opposite is not. But because I love that one so much, and because she lived through the Blitz in London, I trust her more reading about it. Like, it's going to be much more authentic than, uh, obviously, a modern-day writer writing about what that could have been like she lived through it. So let's read the blurb of this one. It says, Elizabeth Simpson is a secretary having an affair with her married boss. Her father is an air raid warden and her terrified mother takes her courage from concealed bottles of rum. Owen Cathcart, their neurotic teenage neighbour, slips out during night raids to watch the fireworks and collect souvenirs of shrapnel. And Bob Craven, a soldier Elizabeth uses as cover for her illicit romance, plans his taxi rides to see the most dramatic bomb damage. In this riveting drama of life during the Blitz, the extraordinary immediacy and vivid intimate details stem directly from the first-hand experiences of Barbara Noble, who lived and worked in London throughout the war. The result is a unique social document and an unforgettable reading experience. Okay, so I'm going to purchase a copy of this book and then let me read this one too, which is the short story collection by Catherine Lacey and Barney Kapil's poetry collection. So we've got a novel, a collection of short stories and a poetry collection, which is a nice mixture of things. Um, so I'm going to take you on this walk with me and then I will check back in with you once I've started reading these books and we can see if these authors are authors that I actually loved or whether they were one hit wonders.
Good morning. It is a few, good morning. I think it's about midday. It's a few days later and my book has arrived. Hurrah. So all of them are here and I'm going to start reading. Um, every morning, I swear, my body panics. Like it's been a long time that I've been using this. Any of you who have blepharitis out there, small niche group. When I was young, uh, we were told to use diluted baby shampoo and that's what I've used all my life. But now uh, they have more. <laughs> uh, I was gonna say medicinal type things. This is called uh, blepharsol and I have to use it uh, twice a day. But it smells of um, suntan lotion. It's so weird. So whenever I open it, my brain's like, don't put that in our eye. It's suntan lotion. What are you doing? That's terrible. And then it's like, oh, it's fine. Okay, this is supposed to go on our eyes. And that's okay. This morning, I woke up and I thought, today's going to be a good day. I'm going to get all of the things done on my to-do list. I'm going to smash today. It's going to be good. I just, I don't know, I hadn't felt like that in a while. I was like, yes, come on, today is going to be good. Was it? No. <laughs> no, uh, it is midday and I have spent most of this morning chasing a referral which got lost. Um, and it's just been very feel very emotionally drained and it's only midday. I love our NHS dearly, I love it so much and when everything works it is brilliant but the paperwork situation at the moment, things are just, ah, oh, I don't even, I would like to talk about it because I think it's a, like it's something that I don't know is talked about a lot, like advocating for yourself in medical circumstances or at least I haven't spoken about it a lot. I, know that I would recommend going following uh, Nina Tame. I will link her Instagram channel in the description box down below. I'm gonna link a few more disabled people in the uh, description box down below who talk about this. Uh, just how exhausting it is when things are just not working. Um, I had two scheduled phone appointments with a doctor who didn't call me so I've had to call back and chase out like scheduled appointments that I had been given and then I was not called and then I didn't get any response as to why that appointment hadn't happened. Um, and when I called again today, the receptionist said, you know, he's very busy, Jen, because it's in the Northeast. So I'm having to do the accent. He's a very busy man. Uh, I'll get him to call you back later today, but chin up, pet, yeah? And it's just so patronising. I just would like, you know, people to call you when they say that they're going to call you, especially about really emotionally sensitive things, which this is. Anyway, he has called me back now, um, and the stuff that needs to be sorted is sorted, but I don't even know if I'm going to keep this in the vlog. I feel like I've just gone... <laughs> at you if I did keep it in apologies for blurting at you but um yeah the reality of some medical stuff adore my doctors love everything the NHS has done sometimes the system doesn't work and anyway other medical things but fun medical things look what has arrived in the post um so as you know or may not know if you haven't been around a while I'm losing my eyesight Fun times. Um, my left eye is very scarred at the moment, which my and my right eye isn't. And when I am reading or looking at a screen for a long period of time, especially in bright light, if it's in lowish light, it's okay. But given that we're moving into summer and everything, sunlight, bright, etc., uh, I wanted to try and find something to stop me getting headaches because if I'm reading a lot of text and my brain is trying to see through all of the scarring, it just gives it a headache. So I have found some funky eye patches um, and I purchased them. And if anyone is looking for adult funky eye patches, I will link the eBay seller in the description down below. eBay, but is new and this seller also makes eye patches for the NHS as well. So I got a couple of different ones. This one gives me fairy tale vibes. I guess it's like Christmas pirate is what I'm calling it. Um, and when I say pirate, 
I feel like I have to clarify this, makes me feel piratey, but not because disfigurement equals villainy, but because so many old school lady pirates were queer, badass and fabulous and I'm here for that. So this is a glasses patch. I have really quite big glasses, which are actually a bit filthy. Let me clean those quickly. <sighs> really big glasses. So this doesn't fit quite as well as it should, but it's still great. Um, let me quickly clean. So you slip the arm through there. Oh no, on the inside. There we go. And then that rests across the eye and then it's like this. How awesome, love it. So then it just blocks out the light, which is great. Um, so I have this one and then one in boring black, which I'm not sure I will wear because this one is, is much more fancy. And then floral pirate, this is a, just a normal eye patch. Thing with this one is though, is it's maybe because it's a lighter fabric on the outside, it does still let some light in, which is not great. So I might have to sew an extra bit of fabric on the back. But let me show you. So that you wear like this, and then I would have my hat on too because of my alopecia which looks like this. I'm a fan, I like this a lot. So I'm hoping this is gonna help uh, for headaches and all of that stuff. Feels good to find solutions to things. Transition phases are always really difficult with disability. Um, that's the scariest time. I find it the scariest time when there is a new part of your condition that you have to learn to adapt to. Um, uh, and then once you find solutions, everything feels a, a bit more manageable. So I'm very glad to have found those cool things. This is the, I feel like over the past few years, just making, uh, I guess disability aids, this is a, form, is a disability aid, um, or at medical things into fashion accessories, such as my hats to cover up my hair loss uh, and the funky eye patches to help with eyesight loss. Anyway, <sighs> this afternoon is gonna be better, I can feel it. Uh, work stuff at the moment, I am doing some work for the Scottish Book Trust, um, doing an event for schools about fairy tales and disability and disfigurement. So I'm gonna do that this afternoon. Uh, and then this evening, hopefully I can get onto reading some of these books and I'll come back and talk to you about them. So I'll see you then. Okay, so I've read the first two stories in Certain American States by Catherine Lacey. And I adored the first story and I didn't like the second one. So a bit of a strange start. The first short story in here is the Oscar winning type of short story because it's very meta in that films about films win Oscars and this is a short story about short story writing so it's about a man whose wife left him and she was a writer and he still receives magazines that she's subscribed to to the house and then he receives a journal that she's been published in and he's telling himself that he's not going to read it. He's not going to read it. The beginning of the story is hilarious. The first page and a half is all one sentence. Let me, let me open it here so I can read you a little bit. And it's like this ridiculous conversation that he's having with himself about how he wants to call his wife to tell ex-wife to tell her that she absolutely should never write about him. And if she ever writes about him, he's going to sue. But at the same time thinking, I actually really want you to write about me because I want to know the inner workings of your mind because I don't know what you think anymore. Um, okay, where do I even start with this sentence? Because it's so long. Okay, so in this part of the sentence, this very long sentence, he's imagining confronting her about characters that have previously appeared in her books who he thinks is like him and what she would say. 
She would probably respond to this by saying that it was ridiculous and childish of him to accuse her of writing autobiography, especially since he knew how much trouble such accusations had caused her in the past. And even if she did end up writing something that contained some or many details that echoed her life, as every writer did or had done at some point or sometimes constantly, she knew that he knew that she was not interested in writing memoir and she knew that he knew that she was as a reader and a writer only interested in work that used the tangibility of character and plot as a method to elucidate intangible ideas not to record a personal history and even if she did write a character that somewhat resembled him she could never really write about him the truest and realest him because there was no such thing as an immovable constant self and even if there were such a thing she certainly couldn't claim she knew his or if she did it was so far too abstract to put into words and anyway he had always seemed either incapable or or indifferent to being emotionally vulnerable with her and even after all their years together she was still baffled and deeply hurt by the southern revelation of his secret cruelty and the damage he had been capable of inflicting on her so of course she wasn't going to write about him because clearly she had never even known him it's just so so hilarious that this is a whole conversation that he has manufactured in his head i sympathize um and when he obviously does open the journal with her short story in and reads it, he's complaining about how long the sentences are, how overwritten it is. And it's, it's just very meta and funny. The second one is not meta and funny. So the second one is about a woman whose brother has recently died and her mother has said that she wants to move from Texas where she's from and move up to New York to be with her daughter, but really it's because she's lost. She doesn't actually want to be in New York and the daughter knows that. So there's this unspoken sadness between them where they're pretending to need each other, but actually it's just because they don't have anyone else. I really like that premise. I thought that worked really well. But when the character is walking around town, she's well, actually she's out running, I think. Um, a man comes up to her who is deaf and has a scar across his face and she says that she has this fear in her that he's going to sexually assault her or be violent in some way and then she says oh I just think that because I've been conditioned to think these things so it, like it's acknowledging fear surrounding uh, disability and also race which she mentions in that without saying that this deaf man is also black but i assume he must be given the rest of the text around it and then at another point in the story she encounters someone who she says has a hunchback and he's talking to her on a bench and she doesn't want him talking to her yes the story is writing about basically a Karen in a park, right? A white woman who is very prejudiced against people and thinks it's okay to feel that way towards other people because she's acknowledging that she feels that way and brushing it off and not interrogating it in any way. But in Catherine Lacey's, a little bit, let me try the one again. But so far in Catherine Lacey's writing that I have read, Disability, and disfigurement have been used as teaching moments for non-disabled protagonists or to make a point or as some kind of symbolism instead of actual characters who have disabilities and who are part of the narrative too. And I don't like that. I really pet peeve, massive pet peeve, red flag. So that's definitely something that I'm gonna be very mindful of reading the rest of this book. Um, so no conclusions so far. A really great story and a bit of a not so great story. Good night. Hey, I'm putting laundry away. As you can see in the next clip, which I was just editing, I realized that I have a bit of toast on my lip and I could just refilm the whole thing, but I was talking to you about books and things that I was passionate in the moment and I don't really want to 
redo that. If you were here in the room with me, I know that you would have told me and that would have been your friendly advice, but I'm just here in the room with the camera, which doesn't give me friendly advice or tell me when I have stuff on my face. So we're just gonna live with the fact that in the next bit, I have a bit of toast on my face. That's it. That's life. Bye. It's a few days later and I have started reading The House Opposite. I don't think I'm gonna finish all of these books in this video. I'll talk about them in my wrap up. So this is like a first impressions of the books by previous favorite authors that I'm reading. And I am loving the beginning of this one. This is the one that, as I said, is set during the Blitz. And I think what I particularly like about this is that it's not dramatic. So many books about the Blitz or about World War II that I have read are understandably about the immediate danger and trauma of those situations, which is obviously so valid. And yes, let's write and read about those. But this is taking a bit of a different view in that it's the exhaustion. It's the, oh yeah, the Blitz is still happening and we don't have the capacity to be at that level of anxious the entire time so we've sunk into it a bit and I think it's um it's weird to compare the two things but it that sense of exhaustion is kind of I feel like where we're at with all world things right now you know it becomes your I hate that phrase new normal but you, you know what I mean you sink into that it becomes just usual and you hate that it's usual and it's it's a strange place to be. It feels very alien. So she's talking about walking around London and how empty it is and no one is there because it's the evening and there are a few restaurants that are open illegally, or I'm not even sure if it's illegally, but ill-advisedly because everybody else has gone down into the tube stations to hide from the bombs, which are going to be landing very soon. The sirens are already going off, um, but she just has blitz fatigue and she is dating her boss and they're sneaking around together and yeah I'm just really enjoying it the writing style is very similar to Doreen it makes you feel is safe a weird thing to say about a book I feel like I'm in safe hands reading her I feel like yes you know what you're doing you know how to write a good story I can just be with these characters and have them feel like friends and I, I'm really enjoying that so I'm not very far into it but enjoying it immensely. I thought I would show you what arrived in the post this morning. I bought The Last Resort by Jan Carson. I haven't read any of her books before. I know that she wrote The Firestarters and something else as well. Let me see. Quite a few other things. Um, Postcard Stories um, and Malcolm Orange Disappears. I read her short story in last year's BBC National Short Story Award anthology. It was my favourite of the shortlisted stories. I thought it was phenomenal. And if I can find it, I will link it in the description box down below. If not, I will link the anthology. I think she's able to convey such an amazing amount of stuff in such a short period of time. And I also bought Sick, which is an anthology by disabled, chronically ill people. This is Sick issue number two. So I'm very much looking forward to reading that. But this, I should have said what this is, The Last Resort. This is giving me Summer Water Vibes by Sarah Moss because I think it's set on a caravan park, it is. And then this is a collection of short stories and each short story is about one person who lives on that caravan park. Um, and this was read out on BBC Radio 4. So very much looking forward to that. And that's a good segue to talk to you quickly about today's sponsor, which is Skillshare. Um, speaking of short stories, writing short fiction about Jan Carson being able to make you feel immediately within the setting of whatever story she is writing. Skillshare have many classes on short story writing. Let me tell you who they are first. Skillshare is um, a company that I have worked with the longest on YouTube, I think about five years. I think that they are great. They are an online learning community and they have over 25,000 classes on loads of different things. Baking, how to look after houseplants, how to start a business, how to design a logo, how to write short stories. They have writing classes from Roxanne Gay. Um, but the one that I particularly wanted to mention today is by Ying Lee and she has done a series of videos specifically about 
character-driven short story writing and how the nature of a short story exerts pressure on its own narrative, on its characters to blossom really quickly, to be and be present and fully formed. And that's a really challenging thing to do as a writer, but a really satisfying thing to do when you get it right. Um, as many of you know, I, I'm an author myself. I have written short story collections um, as well as many other different things. And I'm always interested in learning more about other people's writing process, how they approach their writing. I think sometimes we can trick ourselves into thinking that there is one particular way to approach certain forms of writing, you know, read a book on how to write a novel and then you'll know how to write a novel. And that's not true, which is not to say that classes aren't helpful, they are. But what I think the most helpful thing about classes, apart from the individual tasks that they set, which is a tangible thing that you can do, is just hearing somebody talk through their method and realizing people do this all the time. Writers write things, they complete them, things get published, it's a thing that happens. So it's not alienating anymore. I just really enjoy hearing people talk about the way that they write their own books as someone who also writes books. So I will link Skillshare at the top of the description box down below. They have very kindly given me a link and the first 1000 of you to click on that link will receive a free trial of Skillshare Premium. If you fancy staying on after that month, it is a very affordable platform. It's less than $10 a month and their classes are really compact. They're split into a few minute long sessions so you can get to them whenever you have the time to do so. It's a really great place to be. So thank you very much to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Something else that I need to do today in between work, I'm currently working on some non-fiction pieces for submission, is package up this actually. I should keep the lid on before I uh, pick it up, otherwise it will fall over. This is the best escape room that Mr. M and I have done so far. So this is Unlock. I wanna say it's number eight. I can't remember, but it's called Mythic Adventure. This one in particular, you get three escape rooms in here, card games, um, with different clues for you to solve, different riddles, so much fun. You download a free app and then you um, play along with the app because it's timing you and playing atmospheric music. I've mentioned this company before, but this one is much better than the, the, the other one that we played by them. So I'm gonna pack this up because this escape room is really good. You can play it more than once, not yourself because you know the solutions, um, but you don't have to cut any of the cards up or destroy them, which you do with other escape room companies. So I am gonna pack a, pack, pack, package up each individual escape room it's very small. I mean, the packaging is ridiculous. Look at that. So three individual games. Put a hairband around this or something and send them to Lauren and David because I think that they will really enjoy these. So I'm going to do that. Get on with writing work. And then I'm going to come back to you once I have read some of Barnu Kapil's work. I'll see you in a bit. You know, we have reached the end of this vlog, Nelly. I'm gonna to speak to you about this one book and then I'm gonna bid you farewell. We have reached the end of this vlog and I haven't baked in this vlog or cooked anything. I feel like I've let myself down a little bit, let my brand down. I'm sorry, we can cook next time. Um, so I have read the beginning of Barney Kapil's book, Schizophrene. This feels a lot more academic than her other book that I read last year, which was How to Wash a Heart. Academic and it feels very much like an art gallery. So she focuses on one particular image and then she moves across and we'll talk about something completely different. There's a lot of space between those stanzas on the page. It's, it's very much prose poetry and I'm enjoying it. I think it's gonna take me quite a while to read through because it does feel very dense, very purposeful, very mapped out and important as though she really is grabbing your hand and saying, can we please look at this and discuss it for a while? Okay, absorb that. Now, let's move on to this bit over here, which is slightly connected, but not really, and let's talk about that too. At the beginning, she's talking about how she wrote down lots of fragments of poems and then she didn't like them. She couldn't read them anymore. So she took the notebook outside and she threw it into the garden. She threw it out of its home. And then she goes on to talk about migration and displacement and mental illness. 
which comes about possibly because of migration and how those two things intersect and the work that's been done. She's actually speaking to researchers who have been looking into that particular area. And she uses psychosis and images of psychosis to explore that too. So when she throws out the notebook, which contains all her thoughts about migration into the garden, it's like the characters come out of that book and start interacting with the plants around them. And I just thought that was such, such a wonderful image. And the way that she talks about colour is great. It says, nevertheless, reading these words, I can't have them in my house. And so I open the door, flinching from the blue fire of the individual blades of grass, the bonds of the plant material that release a colour when they are crushed. When the book hits the ground, a sub red spike without a source. A stem wrapped in a thin blue and white checkered towel of the sort used to wrap the earthenware pot of unset yoghurt again and again arriving. The rose like a colour just ahead of them, a torch, she thinks, held there and upright in her grandfather's grasp. It definitely is something that begs to be read slowly and absorbed. It feels like almost a process, process of photosynthesis given the things that she is writing about. Um, yeah very much enjoying that and there's something about it that reminds me of J.R. Carpenter's work who wrote um, Static Ocean of Static Ocean of Static? Yes, Ocean of Static I will insert the cover here which was taking records of the voyages of ships um, and then combining them and cutting them up and then sticking them back together again to try and find an alternate story. And that's what it feels like she's doing here, taking lots of different stories of migration and then cutting them up and sticking them together again and, and forming something new. So the three books, Catherine Lacey, loved the first story, didn't love the second story. So we'll see how I get on with the rest of the book and I'll talk about it in my wrap up. I am loving the Barbara Noble book, the novel about the Blitz, the house opposite. Enjoying that very much so far. I mean, it could all change, obviously, but at the moment, very much liking that. And Barney Capil, um, I don't know if enjoying is the right word. I am enjoying parts of it, but I'm more in awe of her work. I just think that she is quite incredible. And I, I think I have the same feeling when I read work by Maggie Nelson or by Olivia Lang. I, I'm admiring their mind instead of being lost in the actual words that they are writing. There are so many different reasons to enjoy a book and, and some of those are opposite. So you may enjoy a story because it completely sucks you in to the book and you forget about everything that's going on in the world. Equally, you may love a book like Schizophrene because it doesn't suck you into a story. It forces you to look at the world around you and see it in an entirely different way. Yeah. I hope that you enjoyed this video um, and that you are having a good week. I would love to know what you were reading in the comment section down below and if there are any books that you loved last year or earlier this year by authors you haven't read any other things by and therefore would like to read more by. That was a very long-winded way of saying that. Are there authors who you think could possibly be new favourites but you've only so far read one book by them? Let me know. I hope you're all doing okay and I will speak to you very soon. Thank you very much to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Don't forget to click at the link at the top of the description box down below and go and explore all that they have to offer. I'll speak to you soon. Lots of love. Bye.